coming up on Naked H. Rock Lodge Barry shares his secret for fitting in as a nudist. We started wearing shorts during the day so that we'd get a tan line. Because this way, when we would go swimming nude at the Y at home during the winter, we wouldn't be questioned about why we didn't have a tan line. The double life of a lifelong nudist. Plus, the big bang of American nudism. Coming up right now on Naked Age. Stick around. This episode of Naked Age is supported by a sponsorship grant from the American Association for Nude Recreation Education Foundation. Learn more about the Anar Education Foundation and their mission, or make a donation at aanr-ef.com. Welcome to Naked Age, a nudist history series exploring uncommon stories and profiling unique people who have gone to extraordinary lengths to live a nude life. I'm your host, Evan Nix. In this episode, we'll meet Barry Siegfried, a lifelong nudist whose story is intrinsically tied to the history of Rock Lodge, one of the oldest clubs in the United States, born from the Big Bang of the American nudism movement. This is Naked Age. Daily News, December 8, 1931. 24 new cultists, seven of them girls, arrested in a gym. 17 men and seven women exponents of the nudist cult were arrested last night, shortly before midnight, when detectives raided the heart of New York Gymnasium. Detectives, acting upon the complaint of a woman who said her husband was a member of the cult, went to a nearby roof where they could peer into the gymnasium, a third floor loft hardly a stone's throw from Times Square. After watching the men and women at their undraped exercises, they decided they had grounds for arrests. They broke the glass panel of the entrance and went in. Both men and women protested the invasion of the police, asserting their right to exercise as they saw fit. New York Times Union, same date. The notice ran for dressing room, some of the women screaming hysterically. All were calm, however, after they dressed and appeared in night court. While the defendants were dressing, detectives found literature of the organization in the gymnasium, which included membership roles with many more names and addresses. The Brooklyn Citizen. When the detectives made the raid, they found the 24 physical culturists engaged in what might be termed gymnastic exercise. It is believed that the gymnasium may be a metropolitan branch of one of the nudist colonies that have flourished in New Jersey and on Long Island in recent summers. Daily News, December 13th, 1931. Nudists face dressing down for practices. 24 nudists, all dressed up in conventional clothing, will gather around Magistrate William Clapp Monday to reveal the inner workings of their club and to learn whether or not a nudist cult may educate the public. Daily News, December 15th. You had to peek to be shocked. Nudists freed. Magistrate Jonah Goldstein ruled there had been no outrage of public decency because the public couldn't see the performance. I don't want it understood that I approve of nudity in a gymnasium, said Goldstein, but in this case there was no desire aroused. Not only must there be an exposure in a case of this kind, but there must be lewd exposure. Previously, several policemen had testified they had climbed to the roof of a building and peered at the undraped athletes through a skylight. The Brooklyn Citizen, December 15th. The cause of nudism won a partial victory when Magistrate Jonah Goldstein discharged 15 men and 4 women who were arrested for doing calisthenics in a gymnasium while unclothed. The decision of the Magistrate was a mistake. Nudists are out of place in this country, and their exhibitions are viewed with disgust by the public. The cult was imported from Germany and its followers should be deported if possible. These very real excerpts, which I obviously had a little too much fun producing, are meant to comically reflect what was a very real and very oppressive environment for people who were interested in engaging in social nudity in the United States in the early 30s. It was a time of remnant Victorian era morality, during which America's Comstock laws suppressing obscenity and contraceptives were still widely enforced, and where vice squads waged war on peddlers of pornography and other quote-unquote perversions. And yet, it was in this pressure cooker that social nudism arose in defiance of labels of perversion as a legitimate social movement in the United States. 
the first groups emerged in New York, like a small boom, one which spawned at least three landed New Jersey nudist clubs, each with influence in the rapidly growing national nudism movement. It was from these prototypical groups that American nudists first developed their version of the private nudist club, a model which has persisted despite a torrent of other social changes over the following century. Today, we will dive into the story of one of these original historic groups, namely Rock Lodge in Stockholm, New Jersey, arguably the oldest landed club in the United States, born of the great nudist Big Bang, and Rock Lodge's path to permanence, not only as an incorporated nudist club, but as a culture of neighbors, which has persisted for over 90 years. And we will meet one man, a man named Barry, a man whose personal story is intrinsically intertwined with the story of this great club. And all of this is coming up right after this. If you're someone who's ever wondered about the cultural aspects of nudity and art in the world, look no further than Planet Nude. At Planet Nude, we go beyond skin-deep discussions of nudism and delve into the current cultural, intellectual, and philosophical topics around nudity, exploring the way it's been used in art and activism, and the impact it has in our lives today. With a diverse group of contributors, Planet Nude brings thought-provoking essays and art uncovering everything from the history of nudism to the latest news. Join the close free conversation at Planet Nude by subscribing on Substack today at planetnude.co. See you on Planet Nude. The group of nudists who were arrested in that police raid on December 7, 1931, was known as the American League for Physical Culture. Their founder was a German immigrant living in New York named Kurt Barthel and was among those arrested late that winter night. By that point, the American League for Physical Culture, or ALPC, had been organizing and conducting nudist gatherings around New York for about a year and a half, usually traveling to outlying rural areas where they could find some space and privacy to be nude outdoors during the warmer summer months. In the winter, Barthel and his group would rent space in local gymnasiums, where through an agreement with gym owners, they would lock the doors after hours and have the gym to themselves to exercise in the nude. The legal ramifications for the nudists who were arrested in the raid were minimal, thanks to the New York magistrate who dismissed the charges. As for the ramifications for the ALPC, Barthel was surely pleased. Because of the flamboyant press that the raid received, the fledgling Nudist League's membership actually grew. Already by this point, there had been disagreements between group leaders and members over the direction of the group. Some ambitious members had split off from Barthel to start their own groups. The most prominent of these absconders was a man named Ilsley Boone. In 1931, Boone launched America's first nudist magazine, The Nudist, which he first sent out as an official ALPC publication. After a disagreement over this erupted between Boone and Barthel, Boone defected and launched the International Nudist Conference, or INC. A few years later, The Nudist magazine became Sunshine and Health, and INC would become the American Sunbathing Association. In 1935, New York State passed the McCall Dueling Bill, effectively banning social nudism in New York. Ilsley Boone set his magazine and the ASA up in Mays Landing, New Jersey, where he also established Sunshine Park as a family nudist resort and headquarters for American nudism. Though it had its competition over the years, the American Sunbathing Association would become the preeminent American nudist organization for decades to come. Ilsley Boone was a titanic force for American nudism and controversial for his autocratic style of leadership. He was not one to shy away from a fight. When his magazine Sunshine and Health was censored by the United States Postal Service, he spent years in appeals before eventually taking his case to the U.S. Supreme Court and winning in 1960. Due in part to his charisma and magnetic presence, he is often credited as the father of American nudism.
Kurt Barthel, somewhat more humble, also often earns that credit. In 1932, after Boone broke off and started the INC, Barthel and the ALPC established Sky Farm on a plot of land in Basking Ridge, New Jersey. Kurt Barthel himself, in a later written account, pins the exact date. April 30th, 1932. Our search for land had ended. We had found our beautiful sky farm. Two weeks later, our farm greeted us with hundreds of dogwoods in full bloom. Funds were promptly pledged for its purchase. Opened May 15th, 1932, Sky Farm generally holds claim to being the oldest nudist club in the United States. Both these stories of Boone and Barthel are remarkable and are often told when discussing the start of the U.S. nudism movement, and for good reason. However, Boone and Barthel do not make up the whole story. Before Boone broke off from ALPC in 1931, another couple, Catherine and Herman Soshinsky, were the first to splinter off and start their own club. As Germans living in New York, the Soshinskys had experienced German free corporate culture before becoming some of the first to join Barthel's group in 1929. Their split from ALPC took place over a year before Ilsley Boone's, in 1930, and the splinter group they formed was called the American Gymnosophical Association. The AGA presumably took their name from the first English language book about nudist philosophy a book called The New Gymnosophy. Its author, Maurice Parmalee, a sociology professor at New York City College, became the AGA's first honorary president. Gymnosophy stands for simplicity, temperance, and continence in every phase of life. It is useful in the rearing of the young, in the relations between the sexes, and in promoting a democratic and humane organization of society. Consequently, the implications of gymnosophy extend far beyond the practice of nudity alone, for it connotes a thoroughgoing change in the outlook and upon the mode of life. Parmalee, a nudist himself, had had trouble publishing his own book in the U.S., including receiving threats from a federal prosecutor, resulting in his book's distribution being pulled by its publisher. Eventually, Parmalee was able to publish the book, but not without taking on the legal and financial risk himself. Like their predecessors, the American Gymnosophical Association would also gather in rented gymnasiums around New York City, and in warmer months would flock to more rural areas in New Jersey. The following excerpt is from an article written by AGA founders Catherine and Herman Sashinsky years later. Around 1930, three of Barthel's members stepped out and formed their own groups, and we as one of them called ours American Gymnosophical Association. We formulated our creed of gymnosophy, stated clearly the scientific reasons for social nudism and the physical as well as mental benefits to be derived therefrom. When the so-called anti-nudist law of then-Governor Smith was passed in New York State in 1934, nudist groups had to move to other regions. Our search for a suitable location led us to Rock Lodge at Stockholm, New Jersey, which we rented immediately. This 200-acre private estate with its old stone mansion, several other large buildings, well-laid out tennis court and above all a wonderfully large lake favored a quick growth of our membership to 300 more in a few years and enabled us to be selected as the meeting place for national conventions of all unis groups in this country in 1936 and 1938 and 1941. While the Sashinskys and the AGA did not officially rent permanent space at Rock Lodge until 1934, it's clear they were gathering there earlier. Newspaper articles placing the AGA at Rock Lodge go back to 1933, and according to the club's local member historian, Dorothy Coleman, other evidence pointing to nudists practicing at Rock Lodge dates back to spring 1932, the same time the ALPC discovered Sky Farm. 
Nudism at Rock Lodge, is the earliest indication we are aware of, was a painting done by Richard Ederheimer. And he's got two paintings in the New Jersey Historical Museum, and it depicts the, the nudists in, at Rock Lodge. Now, I don't know if that was before AGA or during AGA, or that's why they went to Rock Lodge, because it was Rock Lodge was a hell farm at some point. So it all kind of intertwines in that direction. The eponymous Rock Lodge actually dates back to 1907, when it was designed and built as a prototypical fireproof farmhouse model by an eccentric American engineer named Abraham Lincoln Artman Himmelwright, named after the president who was assassinated the year Himmelwright was born. Historian Dr. William H. Ratchfuss wrote of the property in 1928. Up in old Sussex County, not far from Beaver Lake in Stockholm, stands a magnificent stone house that seems a veritable castle at first sight. It towers three stories, is situated on a rocky ledge that has been hollowed out for the foundation. Its walls or partitions are also of stone, and it seems as if one were in an ancient castle in England or Germany. This is the home of A.L.A. Himmelwright, C.E., civil engineer, the builder, and a man much given to nature and the joy of the wilderness which he obtains there aplenty. The house, called Rock Lodge, has a roof of pure copper. Within, rooms are large and inviting. A great-grandfather's clock, with here and there excellent articles of furniture made by the grandfather of the hostess and naturally cherished by her. Upstairs, in the room of the host, is a small hole in the glass made by a stray bullet from the hunter's gun which was meant for a deer. From here, the site is fascinating. In addition to engineering and building, ALA Himmelwright was also a renowned adventurer and marksman. He's got a vast history. <laughs> a pistol, world pistol champion and you know, turn of the century he bought the property and at that point, Stockholm was really happening in place and a lot of resorts were going up and people were traveling, getting out of the dirty cities and Newark and so on. And he, and he um, built our stone house, which still exists in 1907 from local rock and so on. It's, it's a beautiful uh, you know, structure. He was an engineer for Roebling in New York and he wrote a book, which he wanted to sell copies of to people because they wanted to learn how to build fire, fireproof buildings. The bungalow that's still on our property was built in 1916, and that's where the health farm had the men's dormitory. The Rock Lodge Health Farm, which among many other endeavors rented the land before the AGA took up the lease in the early 30s, started in 1920 and ran for two years as a place for tired businessmen. While nudity was not an explicit feature of their advertisements or public literature, their ads did feature the health farm's medical director, a Dr. B.F. Roller, depicted dressed only in tight shorts, displaying an athletic build, and promoting a program that he boasted would help, quote, regain sound nerves, restful sleep, and a hearty appetite. Himmelwright was trying to make the place work one way or the other. Help kids camp, you know, a country club, and one of them was, was that health farm, uh, Dr. B.F. Rowley. Apparently that didn't work, and then he went on to something else. So he kept trying to make, uh, make Rock Lodge successful. Himmelwright finally found some success when he rented the property to the American Gymnosophical Association, who would reside on the land for the remainder of his life. He died in 1936, so everything was auctioned off after then. He, he was friends with Francis DiPaolo before that happened. Francis DiPaolo was the administrator of his estate. They were friends. You know, he took it over. He was able to buy it. I guess they went into default and he bought it. The club's new owner, Francis DiPaolo, continued running a nudist club out of Rock Lodge. In 1938, he, he was also inventoried and appraised the property with Shoshinsky, so they all worked together to, when, he, when he passed away. So Shoshinsky was part of that also. He just didn't buy it. I guess that he was going to lease it. In 1942, the Shoshinskys, who had also been managing a winter nudist club in Florida, left Rock Lodge. They'd later rent another location, nine miles south of Rock Lodge, in Paradise Valley, and re-establish the AGA there. The group of nudists who were left at Rock Lodge incorporated Rock Lodge Club, and in 1946, they signed a 10-year lease with DiPaolo, finally providing some sense of permanence to the longtime members there. And they struggled, you know, putting money together with their pennies in their pocket, 
to try to figure it out. And that's when the, the small cabins or platforms started to form because then they now had, you know, some kind of investment in it where before it was owned by the one person and you never knew what was going to happen. It was not long after this, in 1949, that a new couple joined Rock Lodge Club, a young couple from Manhattan named Marge and Frank Siegfried, who had been visiting New Jersey clubs looking for a place to make their home away from home. One year later, they would have a child, a boy named Barry. At 72 years old, Barry Siegfried has been a member of Rock Lodge for his entire life, spending nearly every summer there. Over the years, Barry has served multiple different roles in the leadership of the club, and eventually retired there, just a few months after marrying Dorothy Coleman, the club's historian who you just heard speak. Today, Barry and Dorothy live together at Rock Lodge for half the year, and travel south in the winter months to spend their time in a Florida nudist club. As a lifelong nudist belonging to one of America's original nudist clubs, Barry's nudist experience was inevitably formed in some part by the club's culture, which was forged by the fires of conflict in the early days of American nudism. As a result, Barry has a unique outlook when it comes to nudity and to nudism as a social movement. And I was very lucky that Barry Siegfried agreed to share his story and views with me over Zoom recently from his home at Rock Lodge Club in Stockholm, New Jersey. What were your parents like? Well, my parents were both in show business. My father was a violinist, classically trained as a, as a child. He got out of the Curtis Institute of Music when he was 17. Mm. And his uncle put him on a bus to New York. And he got his first job with Radio City Music Hall when he was underage. He lied about his age and he fortunately got into the pit, started playing commercial music, which was completely different from, from classical music. <laughs> My mother was a dancer. She tried a little bit to get into movies. And in fact, she did appear in a movie called Devil on Horseback, which was 1936. And it was kind of one of those grade B movies. There, you see how happy we made him? You let that dirty old thing take my clothes. You make him bring it back. Come back here, you. Come back. It was a little. It was a little campy. It was about a Mexican band of thieves who kidnaps this woman from a train. She was 16 years old in 1936 when that movie was made. So they, they both came out of the show business realm, and they met each other at Radio City Music Hall. My mother was a rockette, and my father was still in the pit. But in 1948 or 49, he got very interested in going to or exploring the nudist world at that point in time, which, of course, at that point in time was very hush hush. So he started writing letters. <laughs> and that's essentially how he got involved with it. He and my mother ended up going down to Sunshine Park which was a nudist place at the very tip of New Jersey in Cape May. They happened to be sitting on a dock next to another couple who was from Rock Lodge. And of course, the trip from New York City down to the tip of New Jersey is a very long one. And they said, well, you know, we, we just happen to be here for the day. But if you're interested in some place that's closer, Rock Lodge is only 42 miles from Manhattan. So he wrote a letter and he got invited. And by 1949, they found their way here and they had me in 1950. So <laughs> they were here before I was born. So they got involved with nudism by sending out letters to the editors of magazines or club owners? It was mostly my dad. And my mother was the typist. So my dad would dictate and my mom would type was always signed by him and he would always refer to himself as my wife and I. We would like to visit your facility or you know whatever it was and yeah he wrote a lot of letters to people that he knew were somehow connected to 
the nudist world at that time, which mostly came out of Germany. Beyond proximity to New York, was there anything else about Rock Lodge that you think really drew your parents? Uh, I think it was the proximity to New York. And the other, well, the other thing about Rock Lodge is that we have a freshwater lake that's spring fed. And uh, that is pretty unusual amongst most nudist places because most of them have pools. But Rock Lodge's lake is a lake that you can swim in. So in that sense, we are a little bit unique. Now, I don't know whether that actually played a part in them deciding that this is where they wanted to land and stay, but uh, I think it was mostly the proximity to New York. Do you know who owned Rock Lodge at the time that they moved in? Rock Lodge was a 501c7 by the time my parents got here. They formed in 1946, and they were enjoying a 10-year lease on the property with the owner of the property from 1946 through 1955. And then in 1955, they negotiated a 40-year lease, which was then was going to run to the end of 1995. So Rock Lodge was fairly well set for 45 years by the time they got there. So it was already a cooperative club. Clearly, your, your parents decided to put down some roots there. They, they bought a property or built a property. Is that right? They purchased a cabin. It was an old Sears kit that was a cabin on a site. And uh, the person who put it in, put it in in the late 40s. And I guess in the early 50s, he decided to sell it. So my dad was lucky enough to, uh, I guess, to get the winning bid in. And in those days, you're, we're talking about $3,500 for a cabin like that. Wow. Okay. So, and that was big money in those days. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, wow. I was born and raised in New York City, Midtown Manhattan. Huh. I spent my winters in New York and my summers at Rock Lodge. What would happen is that my mom would come up for the summer and would bring me up with her. And then my dad would come up when he wasn't playing a show or when he was on his days off from a show. He came up on the bus and we were here for the whole summer. Those are my earliest recollections. So in those earliest recollections, you know, what was it like? There were there other families? Maybe you could sort of set the scene of Rock Lodge. There were a number of families coming in in the early 50s and Several of them put down roots, realized that there were other kids here, kids that were about my age. I basically grew up with a set of friends from Rock Lodge that lasted with me for my entire childhood all the way up to the point where I was old enough to go off to college. In some respects, they were more permanent friends than my friends were from school who would change every year. Sure. And to this day, I still know some of them. Some of them are deceased and, and, and some of them have moved on. But there are some who still come back, but are not as active being at Rock Lodge as an adult than I am. That's so fascinating. So you obviously did have non-nudist friends at the same time, and you would sort of go back and forth between these worlds. Yes. <laughs> Yes, um, it was interesting. And, you know, yeah. in those days, and, and I know today, most people are much more open about their nudist lifestyles than I ever was as a child. Back in the 50s, my parents would tell me, now, look, most people don't get to swim without a bathing suit. Most people will not understand that you do that if you try and explain it to them. So it would be better if you would not really you know, talk about this because it would result in questions that would be very difficult for you to answer. And I think as a, as a young child, and I was an only child, I think as a young child, I understood that. And consequently, I kept this to myself all throughout my childhood until I was in junior high school. I think I started to get a little bit more adventurous with talking about this. I got into the eighth grade and one of my friends from school who had been my friend since elementary school, asked me, said, what did you do this summer? And I thought I'd be a wise guy. And I said, I went to a nudist camp. 
And he said to me, get out of here. You did not do that. And I said, well, yeah, I did. And, and he said, no, you didn't. I don't believe you. And I said, well, you, you, you don't have to believe me. But I said, you know, that's where I go and I spend my summers. He clearly did not believe that I did this. <laughs> I realized that I could actually tell the truth and people wouldn't believe me anyway. Yeah. So... <laughs> But yes, for the most part, I kept it. I kept it pretty quiet. And then, of course, when I got to college, I realized that not having tan lines was actually was actually an asset, and not a problem. So, <laughs> so, so once I got to college, all bets were off, and I told people about it. And I, in, fa in fact, several college friends over the years, I invited them up here. Some of whom joined the club and stayed, and some of whom just visited a few times, and some of whom still come back and visit to this day. When do you think you really realized you've been given a unique experience? Was there ever like a light bulb moment where you realized you've had a different <laughs> childhood than others? There, there probably was. And it was probably in my early teens, but I don't remember precisely when the moment came. Sure. I do know that as a, as a group of us who were just entering puberty, some of us, particularly the males, we would go to YMCA's. And in, in those days in the Y, you swam in the nude because it was just, you know, all boys. And so we swam in the nude and we started wearing shorts during the day up here so that we would get a tan line <laughs> because this way, when we would go swimming nude at the Y at home during the winter, we wouldn't be questioned about why we didn't have a tan line. Sure. <laughs> I know it sounds ridiculous and it sounds really funny, uh. but, but we literally did that. <laughs> I spent most of my childhood time with my mom and she used to tell me once people realize how wonderful it is not to have to wear a bathing suit to go swimming, they never want to put a bathing suit on again. But one of the earliest memories that I have of her saying that to me and me realizing how lucky I was to be able to have this environment to go to in the summertime. And my father was adamant about me getting out of the city in the summertime. He said, you have to get out of the city. You have to see what it's like to be in the country where you have so much more freedom than you have in the city. And I think as an early teenager, I just realized early on that this is a very special place and I'm very lucky to be able to be here. Wow. Was there ever a time that you drifted away from Rock Lodge or from nudism? I didn't really drift away until I was in my 40s okay. uh, for an entirely different reason that had nothing to do with the nudism itself. And for a period of about 10 years, I was not very active here. Uh, I've obviously since come back. Yeah. And... Um, that period had nothing to do with the nudist aspect of things. Rock Lodge has a pretty notably uh, historic building that was built by a, a famous architect. Is that right? Yes. Himmelwright. Yes. Um, ALA Himmelwright. And he was also the United States pistol champion in, I don't remember the year, but he was an architect and he worked for Roebling. And had something to do with the design of the Brooklyn Bridge, I think. He loved this area and he owned this property at one time and built what he called a, a stone farmhouse, a fireproof model farmhouse. And wow. to this day, we still use it as lodging for overnight accommodations. It's just amazing. It's, wow. a, it's an amazing building. <laughs> you started becoming involved with the management of Rock Lodge. Is that right? You've filled different roles over the years? Oh, well, I did. I, I was a uh, secretary. I was a club secretary for four years from 1978 to 1982. And then I took four years off. Then I was president from 1986 to 1990. I then took, let's see, I took about 20 years off from Rock Lodge management, as you say. 
Uh, and sure. then in two, in 2010, I, I, I was asked to, to run for the board again. So I ran for the board and I became a, a trustee, no officer position that time. And then about nine years later, I was asked to fill out as vice president an unexpired term. And then I, I was elected for one more term. And then I, I was elected as vice president. I stopped serving in 2020. Uh, but I'm very involved in the background with uh, database management here, and I do a lot of programming work. So you've been involved with running a club over several decades then on some level. Yes, 40 years. When I was first elected as secretary in 1978, I felt it was my duty to go back and read all the minutes from the time that the club started in 1946. And so wow. I did. I went back and I literally, I read everything. And I realized wow. that the stuff that we were dealing with in the late 1970s were being talked about in the 1940s. It, it may have had a little bit of a different perspective, but essentially the same issues. And today I'm realizing that a lot of the same issues are being talked about today that were being talked about in the 1970s and 1980s. Yeah, sure. There are always things to complain about, and a club is always arguing about these things and talking about them. The guy who originally bought the property from Himmelwright uh, who was a chiropractor by profession. His name was Francis DiPaolo. He lived up the road here and he loved us. And that's why he gave us a 40 year lease in 1956. Wow. He gave us a 10 year lease in 46. And I guess the 10 years worked out to his satisfaction. So he said, I, I, I'll lease it to you for 40 years. The biggest problem we had is that the lease that they negotiated in 1956 had no escalator clause. That's how much he liked us. They forgot, the owner forgot, and his lawyer forgot to put in an escalator clause. What is an escalator clause? Okay, so our rent on this property from 1946 to 1955 was $3,500 a year, okay? Yeah. And in 1955, they negotiated the 40-year lease for $4,000 a year, and that $4,000 a year would never be subject to escalation. Wow. So in other, in other words, you know, they left out any kind of clause that, you know, for cost of living or whatever increases, that was not in there. It was $4,000 a year for 40 years. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, wow. I was right. First of all, people were mad. That, that we were now going to spend $500 more than we did before <laughs> a year on the property. I mean, you know, th this is the kind of stuff that people get mad about yeah. or get angry about. And it's just, it's so ridiculous. Okay. <laughs> but, but what's even more ridiculous in our favor to, you know, not his favor was that he got no more money out of the property for all those years that we had it. Wow. And, and so consequently, he wanted to sell the property in 1971. He knew he was he didn't have much time left. And he offered it to us, believe it or not, uh, it was 100 acres for $60,000 in 1971. Hmm. And it, it failed a general vote. Wow. Oh, yeah. Because so your uh, rent was yes, so much cheaper. Exactly. So yeah. we actually we actually did ourselves in because it was so cheap in 1971, 1995 was still 25 years away. Yeah. It was like, that's, that's, you know, that's way in the future. We don't, we don't have to buy the property now. Wow. Well, of course, what happened was, is we didn't buy the property and this became the most talked about subject of discussion for the next literally 20 years. People were so angry that we didn't purchase the property. Many people left after that happened in 1971. 
And this was the subject of much discussion and many arguments over the years. The original owner, Francis DiPaolo, passed away. The property did not pass to his son. The property oh. passed to his grandchildren. Hmm. And the father of the children or the son of the original owner, yeah. he was the executor of the estate along with his father's lawyer. I see. And as time went on, his concept of what the property was worth kept going up and up and up and up. And here yeah. his kids were only getting $4,000 a year for this property. And every time that we would discuss buying the property, the the, the price was way more than $60,000. Hell yeah. And uh, <clears throat> it came to a head during my term as president between 1986 and 1990, there was a group of cabin rights holders, people who were in the cabins here, who just felt that the club was never going to buy the property. And so they basically started a private uh, consortium amongst themselves to raise money to put on a down payment so that, so that they would actually purchase the property for the purpose of the club to be here in perpetuity. Wow. And I had no idea that this that this group existed. You can imagine by the end of my administration that I was very disheartened because I had been really, really trying very hard to acquire the property in the name of the club. Yeah. And now this other group existed, which the son of the original owner had knowledge about. Sure. And my negotiating position, and I had a committee that I was working with, our negotiating position was com completely overrun. And so by the time I, I got out of office in 1990, I was ready to take the next 10 years off. And that's why I was off during the 90s. It was a very, very difficult time for me. I'm just kind of curious, you know, obviously the ends were the same, which is that the club... They, they were ultimately successful, and it's probably the only way it could have worked. I, I realize that now. And after all these years, since they incorporated themselves in 1990, after all these years, we finally own free and clear all of the property with no, with no outstanding loans, or they own, I should say, the subset of members... Sure. who are in that organization and, and have bonds to uh, give them the uh, occupancy rights to the cabins and to the rooms and stuff, that, we, they, that, that organization finally owns it. And uh, the club is its primary source of income because the club now pays its rent every year. Sure. Wow. So, yeah. We have our own board. They have their own board. For many years, I was on the Rock Lodge Club Board, which, which ran the day-to-day on the property yeah. and our and, and and Dorothy was on the RPI board which was the owner's board of trustees so sure well there's a lot of elections around here <laughs> <laughs> yeah i guess so i'd like to bring Barry's spouse Dorothy back into the story here i arrived at rock lodge in 1985 I, I was living in New York at the time, and a friend of mine said, "Hey, we, you know, I want to take you up to this place." And I, I was divorced, and she said, "You got You'd be great for my cousin." So here we go, right? Um, <laughs> so she decided she's going to take me to Rock Lodge. I did not know about Rock Lodge. It wasn't until I guess about two miles before the gate that she told me, "Oh, by the way, you know, it's a nudist club." And boy, did my my. <laughs> my brain explode like it's a what <laughs> so it didn't take me long i mean i did did wind up staying there i married actually that guy i'm divorced from him but um i did do that and and had four kids so two with him and so my life took a wholly different turn from that one that one uh, visit to rock lodge and i've been there ever since <laughs> and your kids were born there too two of them were and my younger my younger one actually was running the the Young Naturist group as well. Dorothy's daughter, Felicity, has become a vocal nudist advocate in her own right. As one of the founders of the New York-based Young Naturists of America, Felicity has appeared on podcasts and television as a public nudist, 
Even once appearing in an episode of Project Runway All-Stars as a nudist model, the designers had to design a dress for. They're naked. Wow, this is new. I can't look. <laughs> Meet the men and women from the young naturists of America. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Project Runway All-Stars. I'm a big supporter of healthy body image, so I really appreciate you guys being here. Like Barry, Felicity has been a member of Rock Lodge her whole life. And they, and they still come, so it's, you know, yeah. four, gener four generations. Wow. She's now she now has a cabin at Rock Lodge, my grandson. She's having another one, so oh, wow. she's she's into the baby baby movement. Yeah. Ra raising some more name raising some more nudists. <laughs> yeah, we are one happy nudist family. <laughs> How did you meet Barry? Uh, at Rock Lodge. <laughs> we knew each other all, many years, ever since I came there, so and then, you know, we became really good friends and I had gotten divorced. And next thing you know, we're hooked up, we're together. We've always been really good friends. So that's how that happened. Dorothy's a, a dyed in the wool nudist. Of all my partners over the years, I have never had a long term relationship with somebody who was already a nudist when I started having the relationship <laughs> and that that had a lot to do with why we got along so well and in my retirement i decided that i wanted to live nude full time so i decided that i would live at rock lodge in the summertime and i would live in a florida nudist park during the winter time and that's what i'm doing now wow at some point, you and Dorothy, I understand, made the decision to build a new property on the same land that you grew up in. Yes, we took the Sears kit cabin down because it was, it was really not salvageable. We purchased a bond. We got permission to, to tear the old cabin down and build this beautiful log home, log cabin, in, uh, basically on the same footprint, a little bit larger. And um, we were very lucky to have been able to do that. So we did that around 2004, 2005. And Dorothy basically designed the cabin and designed it to be a place that we could, we could live in, you know, during the summertime. And that's how we migrated from a Sears kit to a place where I can now spend my summers, you know, full time in the summertime. I never thought in a million years in 1990, I never thought that I would be here full time. This was not on my horizon at all. And it was only after coming back in 1999, I became friendly with Dorothy. And it wasn't until I became Dorothy's partner that we said, well, let's do this. You know, this is something we both want to do. So you retired what year? 2012. And since then, basically, you've been living full time as a nudist in, in retirement? I have. I've been, well, of course, when we leave the environs, we put on our clothes to, <laughs> to, to, to go out. But, <laughs> right. but yes, in, in, in essence, I made the conscious decision that I really like getting up in the morning and being able to open my front door and walk out nude. I, I decided that I really like to do that. And the funny thing about that is that if you were to say to me, had you not grown up in this environment, would you be a nudist today? I would have said, and I still say, I don't know, because I don't know if I ever would have found my way to this kind of living, which for me makes the fact that I was born and raised in this environment extremely important. It fascinates me when people get into this lifestyle as adults. I am fascinated by what motivates them to do that because I don't know that I would have done that had I not had my childhood nudist experience here. So do you think on some level its importance to you is almost due to the fact that it's been the way you've lived your whole life? 100%. Wow. 100%. To me, it's the only thing I've ever known. 
I don't know if I hadn't had that experience as a young person or as a child, I don't know if I would have just started doing this as an adult. I don't know whether I would have even ever found it. Wow. Much of the research and archival material that exists from Rock Lodge Club was thanks to a man named George Selmer, a member who first came to Rock Lodge in the 1930s. Wonderful, wonderful historian. He, every year he gave a slideshow. I'm just fascinated by it. And when he uh, passed on the 1999, I think, something like that, I took on the, um, the, you know, kept it going and doing more research. And every time I find something new, I wish he was here to share it with. As a matter of coincidence, it was George and his wife on the dock at Sunshine Park who first informed Barry's parents, Frank and Marge Siegfried, about Rock Lodge's club just 42 miles from Manhattan. That's where they... George Selmer. Oh, yeah, George Selmer, of all people, told them about it. And that's when they wound up uh, coming up and they, they were there ever since. Oh, wow. Ooh. So he was the one that drew <laughs> Barry's parents. <laughs> yeah. The Rock Lodge. There wow, you go. Interesting. The history, the history continues. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this episode of Naked Age included music licensed with permission from the Independent Music Licensing Collective as well as sourced from the Free Music Archive under a Creative Commons license. The theme song was composed by me, Evan Nix. Please see the show notes for detailed credits. Historical excerpts were performed by Wynne Manning, Priscilla Hagen, and David Lennick. Special thanks to Rock Lodge, Dorothy Coleman and Barry Siegfried, Anthony Leone, Stefan Deshane, Shannon Lewis, Timothy Sargent, Tony Mitchell, Carl Hild, Felicity Jones, the Western Nudist Research Library, and the Anner Education Foundation. If you enjoy Naked Age, please head over to your podcast platform of choice and leave a rating and review. Your testimonials help Naked Age attract new listeners to learn about the fascinating history and culture of the nudism movement. Also, if you'd like to support our work further, please consider a paid subscription to our Substack newsletter, Planet Nude. Paid subscriptions there help support our research and content for the newsletter, as well as this podcast, both of which are labors of love. You can become a member at planetnude.co. You can listen to past episodes of Naked Age or read the behind the episode blog at nakedage.co. You can also connect with me on Twitter at Naked Age Pod or Planet Nude Vlog. Thank you for listening. On the next episode of Naked Age, a founding member of Canada's National Naturist Federation shares what went into bringing Canada to the international nudist stage. Both sides decided to come together in 1989, I believe. And we started with consent of both organizations, the union that made it possible to be represented as one organization in the INF, in the International Federation. Diplomacy and Nudism on the next Naked Age. Coming soon.